Yoav, thanks for being with us today. Hi, Dave. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, your technology enables rapid prototyping and production of high-performance electronic devices. A lot of applications, military, academia, biotech, aeronautics. Talk to us about the technology and its uses. Okay, this technology, which is unique, we produce machines that are using three-dimensional technology to inject two materials at once. They're both dielectric and conductive material. And as they inject them, comes out from a digital file on the other side of the machine, a product, a real high-performance electronic device, which we call HiPed. Some people call them very high-performance PCBs, printed circuit board. And this device works, so which means two materials melting at 300 Celsius and 1,000 Celsius, yes, it works as electronic device. This is very unique, and it's changing an industry from a, a analog old industry into a digital industry. You can actually have a machine like ours, which is the size of two uh, refrigerators, and you connect your computer and send the device designed by your engineer and comes out the actual device. Customers, including people uh, in the defense industry, uh, can't name all their names. Uh, some of them I can name in Europe, Hensold, Rehau in the Internet of Things and uh, Smart House. Very many um, academic institutions around the world. We sell in four continents. 50% of what we sell is the defense and aerospace industry. We sell 50% of what we sell is in the United States, a third in Europe and the rest of the world. And I can give you an analogy, if it's okay, Dave, about to people who are not electronic engineers. What does it actually do? And the analogy is the desk of publishing. 25 years ago, people used to manufacture brochures by designing it by hand, taking it to a production house, 2,000 square meters, 20,000 square feet of production facility, printing papers, process takes back and forth a month, and then eventually you produce 50,000 brochures, send it to, to your customers. Then 10, 15 years ago came the desktop publishing, 20 years ago, and suddenly you have a computer in the office and you have a huge high profile machine printer in the office, prints everything in colors, glossy paper, and you don't need to prepare and to have inventory and to go to production house. You do it all on your machine. That is what our machine does for the PCB industry. The PCB industry is a $70 billion industry, mostly moved to China and the Far East. And the United States and Europe lost it because it was so heavy in uh, labor and in capital intensive intensiveness. We are changing that. The machine can bring this industry as a clean one, digital. We sell the machine. We sell the cartridges like HP is selling cartridges. And it's a clean industry. So you're basically sending a digital file and you can manufacture these parts in hours versus weeks or months with traditional uh, capabilities. Yeah, the prototyping, instead of taking one of our customers in Europe, Hensold, said they developed a very sophisticated PCB in-house and they decided to compare. So they gave it to two groups. One group did it traditional way and one group did it with our machine. The difference was a traditional way took the development and the prototyping four months. With our machine, it took about seven to 10 days. And that's revolutionary. You, now you have several military applications. I think you said earlier that uh, in a previous interview that the Israeli military is using your technology, perhaps the US military. What would they use it for? Uh, what I can tell you is in general, in the defense application all over the world is being used in places where you need miniaturization of devices, when you need devices that are in three dimension and can be squeezed into small spaces, you can realize yourself what spaces they are. You can use it when you need RF devices together with electronics when they are on, in missiles or in space. You can use it when you need very light, when you, very light devices, when you can condense a lot of things in small volume and it's light when it's flying in the air, anywhere in the air. By the way, not only in defense, it's true for aviation in commercial aviation. That's what the defense industries are using our, uh, our technology. Now you raised more than 300 million in recent weeks. You have a cash balance now around 400 million. Uh, how do you deploy that capital? Okay, we have a very, very clear direction and plan, which obviously 
changed and developed over the last two months during the corona as we realized that the market is actually supporting us so strongly. So now, with the amount of money you have mentioned, we intend to do really two things. We intend to use part of it for acquisitions of companies that are synergistic with our technology and with our markets. Obviously, we don't have competition yet, but we have what could be competition. So we intend to defend ourselves that way and improve our product by buying these companies. And we're talking uh, together with Nidam and Company, which are M&A advisors. We're talking, I spoken with 35, 40 out of 65 companies I looked at over the last four months. So that will be a use of proceeds of about half of that money over time, obviously, in the right price. The second half is we are accelerating a product development. Uh, we decided that rather than investing and over-investing in marketing and sales right now, when the market is really not there and the corona is keeping our customers at home, and this is not software business, they can't work from home if they're working in a laboratory. And so any money we spend on that will be wasted uh, until corona, uh, corona uh, subsides. So we estimate the corona will subside in two, three quarters. So in this time, we are investing the rest of the money, and we're not going to finish it. We have enough for the next five to 10 years, but we are going to accelerate dramatically the product development. We will get to the inflection point, which takes valuation of the company and revenue 10 times. And the inflection point is when our machines, which are now in development, are getting into production, not only prototyping. The minute our machines start to produce larger volumes of a high performance electronic device, HyPids, we will be uh, in a position where the desktop publishing was 20 years ago. We're changing the industry, and more importantly, we're making it clean industry, environmental friendly, and being able to reshore it back to the United States and Europe, where $70 billion of it, or 65, is in the Far East. Now, this technology was developed in Israel, as I understand it. Uh, there is no competition for this technology, that you're at least a couple of years ahead uh, from anyone that would want to try to replicate what you're doing with this technology. Is that correct? It is correct, but I, I, I actually, it's true. I have about, we have, I believe, about two years, uh, a year and a half to two and a half years of runway, but I don't like businesses that don't have competition. So. To, hey, to say no competition, yes, if there's a $70 billion market, of course there's a competition, but the competition is the old market, the old way of doing things, which means if you look at a picture, uh, if you research it on, on the internet of a printed circuit board manufacturing facility, you'll see an old factory, it looks like a printing house, the way a printing house of newspapers used to look. Huge machines, very expensive, very sophisticated, but it's an analog process. This is our competition today. We are going to disrupt this industry and change it. So I consider them as competition. We need to educate the market at, and the other competition that will use technology similar to ours, I believe is about two years away. Okay. And one of the most important things about this technology is you can protect the technology because you're simply sending digital files to the machine and you're creating that high performance uh, electronic device. Yes, the, one of the reasons many of our customers, uh, definitely the defense industry, but including by the way, aviation and surprisingly enough medical are interested and excited to, to buy machines where we sold 60 machines uh, around the world in four continents, is that they are very leery about the ability to maintain the IP if they sent design to the Far East. And uh, actually, the defense industry, by, by government instructions, some of them are not allowed to send it to the Far East. So by using our machine, they keep all the IP at home. They don't have to send it anywhere. What would you say today uh, is the essential value proposition for investors in a couple sentences? Okay. The value proposition is the following. You are investing in a company that has a very, very... Uh, strong balance sheet with basically minimal to no risk of not being able to fulfill the plan. Point number one, whichever the plan is, which I'll talk in a second. So you no risk on a downside. $420 million in cash is, uh, we need less than that and we have spare in that. 
Point number two, you're investing in a company at the valuation that's relatively low, comparing to what will happen once we get the inflection point, which is not 10 years from now, it's you know quarters and a year and a half from now, where the numbers of size of market and size of our revenue is growing to go to go above $100 million. If you look at present companies' valuations, uh, you will see that the valuation of our company at the inflection point will be closer to a few billion dollars. Now the company is valuation at the price where it is today is give or take six, seven hundred million dollars. So you're investing at a low, a relatively low valuation. Technology that's proven, there's 60 machines already in the market with names of customers that uh, some of them I gave you and the others most of our investors will know. Uh, so it's proven. It is evolving into a better technology where the risks are not technological, but rather engineering of developing a production machine. And you're getting in while the company has enough resources to fulfill this plan. That's the value proposition. Talk to us about your background. Well, my background personally, uh, I come from, I'm a mathematician, computer engineer, and I have a degree in uh, uh, beside mathematics in, uh, in uh, mechanical engineering and advanced automation. But mo most of my exposure to technology came for many, many years in the Air Force. But beside flying and being a deputy squadron commander of F-15, I was a weapons system and avionics officer. That exposed me earlier, before even the commercial markets were exposed themselves to microwave technology, telecommunication, video over wireless, uh, compression, decompression, sophisticated image recognition, pattern recognition, uh, um, avionics, man-machine interface, uh, machine learning. So when I started business uh, at age relatively late at 35, and eventually I moved to the States in 93, I immediately was thrown into running companies that were very advanced in technology, were multi-disciplines, but the commercialization and the growth accelerated growth through acquisitions or in, uh, organic growth were difficult. And that's I started to do it uh, here in the States. Uh, initially, a uh, couple of successful ones, which I was lucky beside working hard. And it led me to do three SPACs when investors asked me to raise money so they can support me, which they did. The SPACs were very successful, all three of them. And that led to the next 20 years where I started to look for companies myself, invest my own money, but only if I run them. I don't invest in companies I don't run and uh, do the turnaround, do the growth and eventually sell them or grow them to be bigger. So one or two of them, I'm still a co-chairman and they're running by other, they're run by partners of mine. I want to go back briefly to your uh, M&A strategy. As I understand it, there's three types of companies that you're going to be looking at for potential acquisition. Give us a brief overview of what that looks like. Okay. We're looking at three types. You're absolutely right. One type is large companies with relatively large uh, revenue base, which are serving the higher side of the PCB market, which was left in the United States and in Europe. As I, as I have mentioned, 85% of it, mostly lower part of the market moved to uh, the East. These companies are serving the same customers we are serving, and they are basically developing high-end PCBs based on traditional technology. So we are look, we're looking to buy one or two like this in the United States and in Europe, which will be serving us as the tool to access very large customer base in a traditional manner, and slowly we will populate that with our machines. Very, very attractive. The second kind of companies are Companies that are much, much smaller, but are developing very advanced technology in 3D printing and uh, additive manufacturing engineering for electronics. And those companies have technologies that we identified that can be integrated into our future machines. So instead of developing it ourselves, we potentially will buy one or two of them. And the third kind of companies, we look at companies that are supplying equipment for electronics to the same customers we supply what we supply, but that equipment is a bit different. It's a uh, testing equipment, very sophisticated uh, optical equipment to uh, control the processes. So it is equipment, uh, equipment suppliers of advanced technology, but not the same like our machine. However, to exactly the same customers and production processes. 
Finally, I want to talk about your revenue sources. You have four revenue sources. Talk to us about that. Yeah, the sources of revenue right now is, first of all, of course, we're selling the machines, which is the razor blade, and then we're selling the razors. The razors are the consumable, the inks that are being used in the machine in cartridges. One kind is the dielectric, the other kind is the conductive based on silver at this point. We are selling them at consumables. So it's re recurring revenue, second source of revenue, materials. Third source is we have an annual uh, su a support agreement, technical support agreement with everybody that buys the machine. Other than the first year where there's a warranty, the next year is paying about 10% of the machine for service contract, which is the third source of revenue. And the last one, we started during the corona, what we call nanos, nano services. Because of the corona and the hold on capital expense and customers not being able to spend the money to buy the machine, uh, we started to offer them services by using our own machine. We have three fabrication facility in uh, Hong Kong and in the United States and in Israel. And they are starting to pay us five, ten thousand dollars per developing prototype for them. And we're working now with dozens of customers. It's growing very nicely. And more important than being a source of revenue, the fourth one, is it keeps us very close to customers. And as the corona subsides, and we see it in the Far East, by the way, as we speak, those people who are using our services are now starting to buy machines. So COVID-19 has definitely slowed down your uh, potential for sales. How does it look for you on the other side of COVID-19, say six months from now? Uh, it's a matter of a working assumption. If you assume, if you will assume that six or you know two to three quarters from now, COVID is down to zero, which means it's totally no effect. There's no tail. I would say that our revenue, which jumped 40% from into 2019 and was going to jump above that in 2020, will probably jump close to 100% in rate per quarter once that happens. And I want to note that uh, ARK Investments, uh, Catherine Wood, analyst there, uh, has a very large position in your stock, uh, which I think is a, a very strong sign for potential investors. I also want to disclose that I do own shares personally uh, in your stock. Uh, I want to thank you today for being with us. Uh, it is a wonderful story. Thank you so much, Dave, and uh, I'm looking forward for the next one.